Hello, and welcome to The Fifth Seat. I'm Constitutional Attorney Katherine Henry, and today we have some exciting topics for you. In fact, our first topic today is regarding whether President Trump is able to nominate or should nominate the next uh, Supreme Court Justice to the United States Supreme Court. Well, I was very enthusiastic to talk about this topic today with you today because it is something that's highly contentious, but what so many people do is they fail to actually look at the source of the authority or the power or the need to do that. So let's take a look at where this comes from. Article 2, Section 2 of our United States Constitution says that the President shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. It also says later on, the President shall have the power to fill up vacancies that may happen during a recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. So in other words, had Senate not been in session at all, President Trump doesn't even need advice and consent of them to fill that vacancy. In fact, he has the power to appoint. In fact, he shall do that. So it's a very important point that we need to talk about because uh, this is not uh, regarding whether he's Republican or Democrat, all the politicizing that's being made about this. We need to remember the words of the Constitution. So uh, to that extent, that's why I feel very strongly about this particular topic at hand. But why don't we hear from the rest of our uh, panel here today. Okay, so does anybody disagree with that? Does anyone feel that he shouldn't appoint a I mean, I would judge? love to I jump don't. in on this topic, Christina and Catherine, because I, too, as you can tell, love the Constitution, Ooh. and I believe that we ought to abide by the Constitution. But what's interesting is that while the president shall do these things, it doesn't say anywhere in there that the grand old, or the former grand old party, which is now, in my opinion, the gutted old party, shall violate two centuries of precedent that required a three-fifths majority confirmation vote. And that's and this has been this goes this precedent goes back to the dawn of our country, and and from 1787 to 1991 there were only three Supreme Court justices that were appointed with fewer than three-fifths of a Senate majority vote, and they were all right after the Civil War, right? But since 1991, the Republican Party has appointed four justices, four, with less than a, with less than a three-fifths three majority ruling, and this would be the fifth one. And what has happened? What has happened since then? We've had, we've had uh, the 1992 Casey versus Planned Parenthood uh, ruling, which was unconstitutionally subjective and set the stage for the, nine, for the 2001 USA Patriot Act, which is wholly unconstitutional and set the stage for repealing the Constitution in entirety, right? Now we've got people getting killed on the streets, in their bed, there is no regard for the Constitution whatsoever, there's no transparency in government, and the President of the United States is our criminal in chief. The guy is actually obstructing justice okay, every step of the way. So shall he do that? Yes, he shall, but he shall not violate 200 years of precedent that requires a three-fifths majority so confirmation when vote. when Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor were uh, appointed, it was a three-fifths majority? The, yes, so yes, the, the, three, the only ones that have not been appointed by three-fifths majority vote was the first one was Clarence Thomas in 91, then we had Sam Alito, uh, and then the most recent two, Kavanaugh and, and Gorsuch. So is President Trump still our president? Was he president in September when she passed, when Ginsburg passed away? Yes. Is he still president today? Unfortunately, in a, he is. And, and in November and December of 2020, is he still going to be president? He is. So whether you voted for him or not, he's still a president? That's and right. And he shall actually make the nomination and then shall get the appointed process going. If he can get the 60 votes, he has my Where support. Where does it say in the Constitution it has to be 60 it's votes? It's not. It's 200 oh, years it's of not precedent. A, oh, it's precedent. Oh, you like precedent. precedent. You know, yes. Okay. The you said you still oh, like case law. <laughs> What's that? What's that? First you said it was the Constitution. Constitution was the Bible, and then you said, Well, now you've you know, heard the, the precedent's there for a reason. The, the reason why the founding. So, all precedent we should follow? You know, when, when you have 200 years of precedent, yeah. So, when it, so, even if it's bad, as long as it's old, we should follow it? 200 years of precedent is not a bad thing. The re, you, listen, Mrs. And Catherine, Catherine, the constitutional attorney. Catherine is a constitutional attorney, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So the reason why the, 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 two, the 200 year precedent is in place is because a simple majority vote, when you're talking about lifetime sentences to the Supreme Court, 
has, has effects that last for decades. And if you can't get, if you can't get enough of the two thirds or a three, it started off as two thirds, now it's three fifths. But if you can't get a three fifths majority vote, which is effectively a, a, a workable consensus, is the reason why they put this in place. If you can't get a workable consensus, then you very well may not be qualified to sit in that seat. Now, Judge, Judge Chief Justice Roberts had no problem getting almost unanimous support. The Republican Party is fully capable of putting forth justices that will get or can get the support well, of that's Democrats not the topic as well, but they haven't done well, it. Recently. They haven't violated the Constitution, and all, furthermore, as we can currently see right now, everything is split partisan. So if it's, they're not violating the Constitution, I don't see why they have to abide by 200-year precedents. And then also you mentioned about three Supreme Court justices. We haven't had three Supreme Court justices in forever, so. Well, and they haven't even, it, it, the whole concept that's being argued is President Trump shouldn't be able to nominate anyone before his term is over. They don't care who it is. That's well, the he, argument. He has the constitutional authority to nominate. And you right. very Right. The duty. It says like shall, that. not may. Shall. You're absolutely okay, fine. He shall nominate, but he shall not get confirmation unless he can get two thirds or three fifths. No, that's not. It's not in the constitution. It's not in the at constitution. All. But here, did let's our, Christina. Did, our, did, did Christina, the founders not know what they were doing? Christina, you mentioned you mentioned that that uh, that this, that you know you argued against precedent just a moment ago, right? My just like is, Catherine you don't have was. To, like, you don't have to follow. I'm not against precedent. I'm not saying you're not required to follow it, though. All right. Well. Let, well, all I'm saying here is that uh, America today is more divided than we have been since the Civil War, and that, and I think the evidence of that is in the fact that we are not that that we have now had four justices, potentially a fifth, without three fifths majority vote. But why and that hasn't happened vote? since the Civil War? But why is the vote not happening? The vote is happening the, the because vote. all Democrats are saying no matter who he picks, we shouldn't go with that pick. So, so that by itself is them doing what they're But all Democrats happening. aren't saying that. All Democrats aren't saying that. I mean, one of the things I want to talk about, maybe you could help me out, Catherine, with this, is since when, when historically is that moment where uh, we started to have mail-in ballots? Like, when did that happen? Because one of the arguments that I think is pretty persuasive is we are not getting toward the, the election. It is happening right now. I mean, I, I've already mailed in my ballot. So we're in that process right now, which for me suggests that this is like one extended election day. And so I think that because of that, we need to take a step back and say, let's have this election and its results roll out and listen to the American people. But I don't know historically when we first started to do that. So, I don't know the answer to that particular like when, question. You know what I'm saying? Because, because your idea of precedent is about, well, let's, let's look at the past. But I mean, mail-in voting wasn't an, an active sort of practice, I, right? I, yeah. think, I, I think that you made a key point there. You said something about the American people, right? And this is the reason why the three-fifths majority confirmation vote is because it's supposed to be serving the American people, not a single party. But that's not what's happened when you I have a lot of I think you've got your point across, bench. Joe. I, I think agree. everyone understands what you believe in. Right. I do. Good. I think, I think it's not relevant because when you have a lot of legislation from the bench, all of the what we used to do and what the... I, that, it, it's a lot of things... It's always like we're looked at to be the bigger person. And sometimes I'm tired of being the bigger person. Sometimes well, I want to win. But you if a, I'm not violating the Constitution, I feel like do what we need to do. And, and you have a good friend. point. Legislating from the bench, it has another term. It's called case law. Mm -hmm. And case law is not a thing. There is no such thing that. as case law. Precedent, what you're talking about, is case law. And that is nowhere in our Constitution. And so if you're a constitutionalist, you're going to stick with what is in the Constitution and not impose things upon certain people because the other side is not wanting to play nice. There's no reason for that. In fact, in here, he would not be doing his job if he is not nominating and filling that vacancy. In fact, if you look at the second sentence that I read, where it talks about the power to fill up vacancies, that he shall have that if the Senate happens to be in recess, the reason for that is there's supposed to be no gap. There's supposed to be cont continuity of government. And so I, I agree with you that you, you know, we have this new you know, concept of mail-in voting, and it's something that we need to keep in mind, and we need to listen to the people. However, the people spoke four years ago and voted him into office, and he is the 
president who's in office today. And so and it's a um, disaster. If, but if something it's, it's a train wreck, regardless, I understand that. But our government still has to keep going. And so regardless of who wins the election in November, uh, he's the president now. Our whole government shouldn't stop until January when we have a new, another inauguration, assuming that that, you know, Trump is not going to be the one in office. Well, how, how would you feel if, if Justice Ginsburg had passed on November 3rd? It would be no different. See, she, I, he, I, I the, think the Constitution that that is the Constitution. It. He what, shall nominate. What about the fact that, that the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, did, you know, deprived uh, the sitting president, Barack Obama, from nominating, from his, fulfilling his constitutional duty, and now he wants to go back on his own word so that he can, he's clearly just doing this for partisan purposes. But, 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 well, let's stop acting like the GOP is so terrible. Please stop, because Democrats will do the same thing. Are we really going to sit here and kid ourselves that if Hillary Clinton was president, she wouldn't appoint a Supreme Court justice? Are we really going to make that claim? The, the case that I'm, the case that I'm <laughs> making is so. that, the case that I'm making is that there is, I'm not, listen, I want to be clear. I am not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Libertarian. I believe, I believe in liberty. And if, that, if, that's, if that's what a Libertarian is, then so be it, then that's where I would fall. But I believe in liberty. And I believe that the two-headed monster has, of the duopoly of, of the Republican and Democratic parties, have been working for the CIA and the Federal Reserve, and they have been systematically dismantling uh, our constitutional so what, law. You're going on a lot of things, but let's, let's think about this three-fifths uh, majority that you claim sure. needs to be there. So let's assume that Biden takes office. Now we have a whole bunch of other offices taking uh, elections taking place all over the country. So um, how are you then assuming that if we do get Biden in and he's sworn in in January that somehow we're going to be able to get some sort of three-fifths majority for his pick? There's no way to assume that. So meanwhile, the government's dragging its feet and the voice of the people is not being heard that already spoke four years ago when they voted for President Trump, but we're supposed to ignore him these four, last four months of his first term? I'm not operating on assumption. I'm operating on the fact that the precedent is good for the American people. So how long, okay, but it's precedent, how long should it go? It's, it's indefinite. So, so we should There's never fill a seat. There's a reason why Supreme Court, if, Joe, if Vice President Biden becomes the president and he cannot garner a three-fifths majority vote, then you need to put somebody else well, up. I want to, but I want to get back to, to something that Christina had said. You brought up Hillary Clinton, and you said so. If she were in there, it's probably likely that she would jump in and go for it, right? Because you know her team is is winning. Um, and I want to get back though to Obama's decision to step back and say, okay, I'm not going to push this issue. Why wouldn't? Um, you know, a, a Democratic candidate do the same. I mean, you know, well, the difference is that was a lame duck section, lame duck session where like this one. So that that really changes things. And then two, if, if, like even the three fifths thing, if we we could be not, we couldn't have a Supreme Court justice for two years. But wait a minute, we but wait a minute. Get one if so, but I mean, Catherine was very, you know, deliberate about the shall and the shall and the shall. Right. What is lame duck? What does that even mean? So, right. I mean, if, she, if she's saying, you know, the people made their their voices heard, mm -hmm. and so we need to allow who, whoever's in the office to ex execute the powers of the office. Uh, you said it doesn't matter, even if it's right to the last second, you know, of the clock. Um, then, then the whole concept of a of a lame duck doesn't exist. I guess the way I look at it is just it's political shrewdness. I guess I feel like sometimes we. We have these, like, these two things, like one, what we should do, well, so-and-so did it last time, so how about now, and then, but when they're in power, they do something different. I mean, that's politics. Yeah. <laughs> I know it sounds I bad. Think, <laughs> I think you've got it um, so clear that the Constitution says this, this is what we should do. Um, why, why all this uh, uh, opinions? Well, uh, and that's exactly the problem. It's exactly right. I don't yeah. think there should be opinions on that. I would be no. saying the same thing if the shoe were on the other foot and we had a Democrat as president or well, what US about president. the mail-in voting, which is, has not been a part of this picture here? Well, it's regardless of all the other opinions, I mean, I, I don't mean to dis, you know, downplay your opinion or your opinion other than no opinion. My opinion, no opinion should matter more than the words of the Constitution. And if the framers of the Constitution thought that we needed a three-fifths majority uh, vote in order to move the process along, they would have put that in here. I have my faith in the framers, and the wording of this very clearly just says the advice and consent of the Senate. That implies a simple majority, because everywhere in there it's a simple majority instead of otherwise. So that's kind of my thought on that. If the Republicans were serious 
about getting somebody confirmed and actually getting a three-fifths Senate confirmation vote. They would look at who they're looking to replace, and they would look at whether or not they can find somebody who respects the Constitution. I believe that Ruth Bader Ginsburg did respect the Constitution. And I know that there's some disagreement there, but she ruled in favor of the Fourth Amendment not once but twice. She also was an Army wife, married for 56 years. And the reason why she participated in her opposition to the partial birth abortion ban is because she was also, by the way, the Nebraska State Supreme Court also ruled against it, which is a very Republican state, right? She was simply uh, opposed to anything that did not include a protection for women's health. As a matter of fact, she referred to, in the dissenting ruling, she referred to the, the procedures of partial birth abortion as, quote, gruesome. So she's not even in favor of that. Mm. She wanted to protect the, the, the you know, women's health. And that's really the issue. And I think that if the Republican Party put forth a nominee, they might actually get somebody confirmed. Well, but but that, none of that has anything to do with whether or not President Trump should appoint somebody. That's, that's, a, that's a side point. So, but right. I think we need to move on to the second topic. Yeah, so Joe. I think that's it, right? All right, so the second topic is, is statehood for Washington, D.C., or where I lived for a year in 2018. Let me get it out because I want to celebrate. Puerto Rico. Shout out to Puerto Rico. This is the Puerto Rican flag. I keep it on my keychain. I live down there. It's a wonderful place. So there's, a, there's, some, there's some argument about whether or not Puerto Rico and DC should become a state. And that is our next topic. And uh, I'll go ahead and kick it off. I believe that if they want to become a state, then the citizens and the residents of D.C. and Puerto Rico have the right to vote on statehood, right? Because I'm pretty sure that's probably somewhere in the code, isn't that? No, absolutely not. It's in not. fact, Article 1, Section 8 of our Constitution says that uh, there's exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over the district, which specifically can't even go over 10 miles square. Um, and that is done by a, a session of the uh, seating of particular states and an acceptance of Congress to become the seat of government. So specifically taking away land and property from states that are giving up of that land to specifically for the purpose of creating uh, a home for our, a seat for our federal government that is not itself its own state. That's interesting. And in fact has um, exclusive uh, jurisdiction, the, the co Congress has exclusive jurisdiction over that uh, to create laws to govern that. Um, and specifically um, also in um, the 23rd Amendment, Section 1, it talks about the district constituting the seat of government of the United States shall appoint uh, in such manner as Congress may uh, direct, and it talks about their ability to have representatives in the House of Representatives, specifically not a seat in Congress because they are not a state, uh, but giving them a voice because we do have 705,000 people that do live in Washington. Um, but we need to be very clear, though, again, uh, Article 1, Section 8, and the 23rd Amendment, those are pieces of our Constitution. So I really couldn't care less what political party is arguing for this or who wants it to happen. It could be the Republicans. It could be the Democrats. It just so happens, as Trump pointed out, Washington, D.C. is, um, he said, all Democrat. There are actually two independents on their city council. Uh, but there's uh, 11 Democrats, a Democrat mayor, and, in fact, their House of Representatives, um, uh, congressman is a Democrat, but to me, I don't, that doesn't matter. What matters is that in the Constitution, the way the land was taken to begin with, the way the whole city was set up, it was for a purpose of being a territory, a district of Columbia, not a state in and of itself. Let me ask a quick question. Do we want to separate between Puerto Rico and D.C.? I think they it's, are it, different. It's, it's totally different. They, it's I think a different that case, case, right? Because yeah. there's no constitutional right. mandate that prohibits Keeping Puerto Rico Puerto from Rico. becoming. By the way, Catherine, you know a way to a man's heart by citing the Constitution. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think, I think that's, Christina, that's a good point, right? Let's pivot to Puerto Rico in particular, mm. because that, that is something in which the Constitution does not explicitly prohibit Correct. having another state. Not added, that I'm aware right? of. But yet the Republican Party wants to argue against Puerto Rico because they believe that they're going to vote Democratic. Well, I, you know, here, you know, I think there are some fair arguments on both sides, honestly, about the Puerto Rico issue. I do think, you know... I think some, some arguments I've heard that some of the people don't want to be part of the United States of America. I know they're a territory and all, but they want to keep their own heritage. They want to keep their own autonomy, if you will, to a certain extent. Uh, I think there are some fair arguments that it will help the U.S. economy because it is a beautiful country. You know, I think there is a fair argument that some people are concerned that we'll take on all their debt. With Puerto Rico having like a 40 percent, and you said 45 percent poverty rate, that will be a massive burden, not only us taking on all their debt, 
and also you have mass amounts of people on welfare, which also could cause a lot of economic issues. So it's nothing against the Puerto Rican people. It's mm -hmm. nothing against their country or it's, it's I mean, well, yeah, their territory. It's, it's nothing to that extent, but we just have to think about the practical implications of how it could impact America and our economy. And that's not something that should be tossed out. Now, Washington DC, Washington, DC, I feel the whole push to make that a state is completely partisan and is not in the welfare of the people who live in well, Washington. Well, and another constitutional provision is um, Article 4, Section 3 that says, new states cannot, no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state. Now, you know, technically the, um, uh, when DC was created and, and we had the states that kind of gave up that land for this purpose, um, you might be able to argue that the jurisdiction isn't there anymore, but the whole reason why it was done, uh, that land was given, was to create this territory that is the District of Columbia, not for it to then become a state. So then uh, we still need to abide by that um, Article 4, uh, Section 3 clause in there. So I don't think that we could do it. It's a totally different argument from Puerto Rico, absolutely. And so uh, I grew up in Orlando, so I know a lot of people that are from Puerto Rico, um, and uh, but it's it's it, there are practical implications for the one. There's definite constitutional implications for the other. Um, but I, what do you think about uh, this? The um, thing that you talked about about their culture and their heritage and so on becoming a state wouldn't prevent that, would it? No, no. I, not, I was just re, I was doing my research on it, and they were just mm -hmm. concerned that some people felt they may get absorbed in and lose some of their distinctiveness. That's mm -hmm. what some of you know, with some people, because last time I, I was checking that when they, they voted on it, I think it was like 60-40, I don't think it was like, it was a pretty close vote as to whether or not to become a state. So there are some people, Puerto Rican people, who don't want to become a state. That's if you trust yeah. the election results, Christina. Well, I don't have any reason to distrust them. I'm not saying they're right or wrong, but I don't have any evidence to distrust them. I don't them, think so we need to distrust them any more than we should distrust all the mail-in voting and other aspects that we have here <laughs> I, in the I mainland. Think the, I think the election integrity issue is much more serious than just mail-in voting. I mean, oh, it is. Right? But I mean, but, but, but before we, we go on to that, I sure. want to talk about uh, the military service of people of Puerto Rico. Yes. And, and that becoming, let's say, a part of the conversation. Um, I don't have statistics, but I know that it's quite sizable. Can you kind um, of expand on that a little bit more? What do you mean about the military the, service of people the of Puerto the Rico? contributions that that residents of Puerto Rico have made to our U.S. military? Oh, they've joined mm -hmm. the oh. military. Yes, a lot of them are and so I think that you know if we look at that historically, um, doesn't that count for something? I mean, one of the things that you mentioned is the high poverty rate, but you could also make that argument for Detroit. I mean, we're gonna you know cut cut the boundaries there. Many and people say let that me too. Ask you, I'd like to hear from both Judy. I'd like to hear from everybody on this. I mean, should we not admit Puerto Rico into it because, like you said, there's a poverty rate? I mean, do we not care? about all Americans, whether or not you're wealthy or poor? Right. I mean, it's not that I'm saying we don't care. I'm just talking about that we got to care about all of Americans as well. And if you absorb several million poor people into the American fabric as a citizen, they're necessarily entitled to those benefits. And that's going to put a strain on our economy. And we can't ignore our national debt. We're in trillions and trillions and trillions of oh, dollars please. in debt. Don't now, even get no, me started you know, on well, the national uh, Well, I'm going to finish. And the thing about it is, is that I'm not saying we can't find a solution. I'm not saying we have to either just absorb them in right away. I'm not saying we can't it find It needs to some, play a part. Work, yeah, I'm not saying right. there can't be a workable right. way to make it happen. Because like, just from an objective standpoint, I personally don't have any real objections to Puerto Rico becoming a state in that sense. I'm just concerned of the logistics of it all is my concern. Now, Washington, D.C., to me, that's just a power grab. Because there's no logistics. There's no, what is the benefit? For what reason? I do have a concern. <laughs> I do have one concern, constitutionally speaking, about mm -hmm. Puerto Rico, and that is what would be the procedure? Because if you look again at Article 4, Section 3 of our United States Constitution, it talks about how, you know, if you're taking land essentially from, the, it sounds like it's describing the contiguous United States, okay? So if you're taking land from uh, another part that's already belonging to another state, uh, you can't do that without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as of Congress. Then you look at Section 3, and that talks about territory. Congress shall have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. So then it's kind of like, well, in this respect then, is it a um, Ar Article 3, Section 2 uh, provision, uh, excuse me, um, Article 4, Section 3 uh, part where it's talking about territories and so it's merely uh, within the purview of our Congress or would it need actually to have a vote of the state, uh, vote from the people 
uh, of Puerto Rico, which I would think, like you mentioned and you yeah. mentioned earlier, on any issue, you have to listen to the people. Mm -hmm. So we need to listen to the people of the United States already, but also to the people of Puerto Rico. And so if there is an election integrity issue, we need to have that addressed first before we can figure out what the voice of the people down there is and whether they do, in fact, want to become a state. Don't we? I, I think absolutely yeah. you do. But to, to address your point about territories, I mean, do you believe that Michigan should have been allowed to become a state? How about Utah? How about California? How about anything west of the Mississippi? All of that were territories, mm -hmm. right? So now we're all... Do you know what the process was then? Which part did the they follow? The same process that would be employed for Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico... But do Rico you know were, what that process was? Please tell me. You're no, I don't. That's attorney. the problem. Okay. I don't I, know I what think, that process was. I'm pretty was. sure the process was that they voted, and, and, and I don't know. I don't know what that process was. But uh, I do know that there is a record of it, and mm -hmm. then we can go back and check right. out that record, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. so what, are, what are your thoughts on the whole election uh, integrity? Do you think oh, that election integrity? Well, yeah. he mentioned, you know, the well, she vo she voiced the concern about that it was like a 60 40 a vote 60 -40 in the past, vote. And, so, and he voiced a concern about there being mm -hmm. election integrity problems. So, and I said, well, shouldn't we fix that first then before? Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts? I, on I that? think it's such a poor country, and there's probably communication problems and transportation problems, so that they would have a difficult time making sure that everyone voted. That's not the. That, That's not the issue. Judy, I respectfully disagree with you. On really? That. Yes. Okay. Uh, I really think that that Puerto Rico. Well, the, you've been the, there. So. I've lived there for a year. I love the people there. They're they're just as well educated as 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 your average American that I would run into, and uh, what they really want is the same thing that Americans want, well, which sure. is which is which is liberty, right? That's all we want. Sure. Doesn't matter what party we're at. We just want we just I, want. I'm freedoms. just saying that maybe they couldn't all get. To the Access vote. to the poll. Well, Access to the polls. Not, okay, well, it would be great if we all could get to the polls well, I in this election. Right. I, I, I just think it would be nice either. to have them officially recognized and given those rights when they're already, Puerto Rico is so firmly a part of the fabric of America sure. mm -hmm. as it is right now. So what rights in, in particular do you think that were, you said those rights, what rights were you getting Well, to? I was referencing what Christina was saying is that, you know, one of the concerns was, you know, we wouldn't want to perhaps open uh, statehood to a, um, a part of the U.S. that had such a high poverty rate and that they would be entitled to, let's say, you know, benefits that would be, you know, entitlements. Well, they already um, have that is what she's saying. Yeah. So what rights are you saying would they would get if they were, uh, if they achieved statehood that they would not be receiving now, specifically the people, the people of Puerto Rico, what rights do you think they would, what was that? Yes. Representation. Representation. Because oh, okay. what I understand, Congress essentially makes all their decisions from what I understand so you know I have like I said I think there's a very fair case the concern is the logistics like when you mentioned Michigan and Utah being territories we were a totally different country then there was so many different things going on so I think the, still applied but, I mean, it's not I'm not making a constitutional argument because I'm not constitutionally opposed to it that's okay. not my opposition I'm right. concerned from the logistical standpoint right. and I think that's oftentimes something that gets lost when we have these grand ideas and mm -hmm. we want to get stuff done it sounds great on paper but actually working it out is a different thing so I'm saying if there could be a plan that wouldn't harm the U.S. debt, would, wouldn't cause mass entitlement increase, I think there's a way that it could happen, but we just have to be worked and out. How bad do you want it, though? How bad do you think that this should happen? I don't, to be honest with you, I don't know how urgent the issue is, uh. to be very to be very fair, because it's something that I've only considered in recent time. You know, I haven't put, I'm not going to lie and say I haven't put a whole lot of thought into it, so. Okay, so can, I, I was a logistics officer in the Marine Corps. And so I would love to be able to comment on logistics. I think we need a whole other show on that, Joe. Well, this, this fits into both Puerto Rico and election integrity, and you're right. I think we could do a show on that. But we're not going to do that right now. All right, so, Christina, you mentioned, you me first off, I'm, I'm going to present the argument, and then we're going to pivot to election integrity. All right, so the first thing you mentioned is, is that Puerto Rico has got a ton of debt, and there will be a lot of people end up on welfare, that sort of thing. The debt argument, <laughs> I mean, but I've also got a background in finance and economics. We just, coronavirus is going to cost us between two and four trillion dollars. Puerto Rico's debt, last time I checked, was like 50 billion, right? So we could, we could pay off the debt with like a penny dropping in that lake over there. That's not an issue. If we really want to talk about logistics relative to the election, then we need to look at election integrity on a broader perspective anyway. Right, because we're arguing about mail-in ballots, we're arguing about the hacking, Russian hacking of machinery and all those things, right? You know, 
I'll let you, this is your topic to take the lead on, but I would like to see us explore blockchain voting. That's a transparent, trustworthy, you know. Um, Can you say that term again? Blockchain, blockchain. voting. It's, it's, a, it's like a, um, it's a new technology, Bitcoin. Yeah, you heard of Bitcoin. I have heard of yep. Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is built on the blockchain. It's a technology that is trustworthy and transparent. It's, it's, it's electronic. You can vote from your phone and it's, it's, it's indisputable. So the, it, it, if provided that it's properly inspected, and unfortunately a lot of these cryptocurrencies have been built in a manner where there's a back door, just like our phones, just like so much, you know, but uh, you know, there, it's a manner in which it allows us the ability to provide reliable, trustworthy, transparent well, voting. Well, with that being said, let us pivot on to election integrity and our concerns. So, you know, there's lots of concern with the election. You know, we've had issues like, for example, I was reading a statistic from 2012 to 2018. There's like 28 uncounted <laughs> ballots, you know, that were either marked as unusable or void or what have you. Um, we just had recently an incident where there were military ballots found in a ditch in Pennsylvania. And they coincidentally were all for President Trump. So and there's the a lot of issues. Well, hold on, let me finish. Right? So there were a lot of concerns regarding, and then the issue of mail in ballots, and we just mass, mailing out mass ballots to people. And then, of course, we need to distinguish that between absentee ballot, where a person goes and requests the ballot versus just, mm. you know, I, I've done door knocking and you go to the house and there's nobody there or the person is dead. So when voter rolls are not updated on a 24 hour basis to keep up with who's moved and who's dead, that could cause a lot you know, of problems. So that, I'm concerned about the whole mail-in voting and election integrity. And on, on that point, I guess I have a concern because Ruth Johnson, I believe it was our most recent Secretary of State here in Michigan, mm -hmm. that um, she, when she was in office, she went through and she cleaned up the rolls of a lot of people. I want to say there were um, seven to 10,000 people that she went and cleaned up the rolls of people that had, you know, passed away or, you know, whatever had moved out of state. Mm -hmm. And uh, just within the last few months here during coronavirus issues, mm -hmm. our current Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, went in and put those individuals back on the rolls and they were part of the individuals that got mailed out these absentee ballots without the request, you know, being done. So I have a huge concern about why on earth would a Secretary of State just add back in people people and mass uh, without an individual, you know, letting us know, hey, I moved back into the state or, you know, something of that nature. This was no, these are individuals had no contact with the Secretary of State whatsoever during that period of time. She just added them back in and they became part of that mail-in Is she able process. to do that? I mean, does she have the right to do that? I would argue absolutely I not. I yeah. think so. She's a partisan <laughs> hack, number one. And then number two, our news media in Michigan should have been all on top of that. <laughs> they, sh they weren't. Because that's the first time I'm hearing that. That's absolutely terrible. In fact, did you guys hear yeah, that our I've secretary? Not, I've not heard of that. Have you guys heard that our secretary, uh, a prior um, Secretary of State, um, Ruth Johnson, and the one before, Terry Lynn Land, are actually suing Jocelyn Benson over these uh, uh, very egregious issues right now. Has anybody heard of that? No. Our no. media has turned a, has fact, done that again? Yes, you know, in fact, I was talking to some people, we discussed having a mini protest in front of our local news stations, because something we like should. that is, you is know something, what I would... people, that's something people need to know, because why would you just mail in votes? And, and, and for people to have this ridiculous idea, oh, it's so ridiculous, we wouldn't have mass fraud, people wouldn't do this. You mean to tell me people wouldn't just fill out ballots for dead people and submit them? Come on, to, to th I mean, people kill and stab each other. Why would we still surprise someone would fraudulently submit a ballot? I mean, that's just so ridiculous. Well, did you hear about Oakland County, the northern part of Oakland County? I want to say that was something around, again, like six or 7,000 votes that supposedly didn't count. Okay, and so th these are rumors, right? I mean- No, 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 there was actually a lawsuit fact. about that. <laughs> there was a lawsuit on it. Okay, but listen, let, let's- Proven talk. facts. Okay, that's, that that's fine, but these are, I think we're no, off, I one. think we're kind of, the real issue here is, is, in my opinion, is the right to vote. Right? So, I mean, of once people you who are alive once you're, and live in Michigan. Okay, sure. right, well, let's yeah. pivot to that then. Okay. All right, because you guys make a good argument. And I'm going to, I've defended the probably the more liberal democratic side so far. I'm at now, I'm going to, I'm going to defend the more conservative side. Right? So, if you, you want to make a comment about people are dead and that sort of thing, right? Election integrity is also related to welfare integrity, it's also related to the effectiveness of government. The real, the reality here is, the, the, the U.S. government does not have a centralized system, an electronic, up-to-date system mm -hmm. that even like Estonia could do. Then they did, they bought this tech like 20 years ago. If we had a centralized system, then we would know if somebody is dead or alive. We would know if they qualify 
for if they qualify for for uh, you know for welfare. For Are you whatever. talking about like basically Big Brother using it for good? No, I'm talking about a fully no. open source, transparent system right. that is that Effective. can be verified and checked by the by the individual, so that Big Brother does not exist. Right. It's not about Big Brother. It's about it's about providing trustworthy, transparent. But a system that would keep record of whether they're on welfare, whether they vote, all those kinds of things, is somehow not going to be Big Brother. Oh, that's, How that's is that? That's, 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 that's what that's government's supposed to do. Yeah. Keep track of people. Government is, is here to serve the people. Yes. You, and so how can you create a system, any system, welfare, social yeah. security, Medicare, Medicaid, if you don't keep track of who's on it? That's that's like it seems like you're making the argument for fraud, waste, and abuse here. Well, well that's well, I mean, that's a still, that's totally separate side issue. We're just talking about election integrity. We just want to make sure that every registered <laughs> voter has a vote. Those are total side issues. We just want to make sure there's not fraud and abuse. And if you have mass mail in mass mailed out ballots, for anyone to say that that is not an opening for mass fraud is just not to me being intellectually honest. All right, so Laura. What do, you, what do you guys think? Yes. I think it's been happening forever. I'm. <laughs> the mature woman here. Um, it, it's been happening forever. I, I worked on the counting board for the absentee bowl, ballots. Yes, you you find a whole bunch of them that are just uh, mis, mismarked and so on. You throw those away. If they would have walked in and um, voted, we could have given them another ballot because they didn't know how to mark it. So they take a real chance of doing that. I, I do a mail-in vote. So I just want to be clear. Yeah. I just want to be clear because anytime yeah. you say uh, throwing ballots away, I think all of us kind of crawl a little bit in Not their skin. Not throwing them away. But, but, but so for example, like in a primary, mm -hmm. if somebody picks, um, you know, somebody on the yes. Democrat side in the presidential yes. nomination category, but then in Congress they're picking somebody on the Republican right. side here in the state of Michigan, right. they, it throws right. out the ballot because you can't that's mark on That's recorded that it's been thrown out. Right, so that's the kind of thing you're talking about. Yes, is, yes. Is, it's, it's not just thrown in the garbage. Mm -hmm. right. right, okay. Should, should, should intent not play a role here? If your intent was to vote for somebody, shouldn't that, shouldn't that count? And if it, and if we're, if our system uh, is set I'm, up in a way. No, we're teachers, you our, don't do that. I know. <laughs> that's it, tough. What do you, to have you your know. vote be disqualified on technicality, okay. to me suggests that there's a problem with the system. The yes. system needs to be set up in a manner where it's resilient enough to withstand minor errors, Ooh, right? Yeah. You, as a citizen, you have a right to vote. And but we I, think be that, I think that, that what you were mentioning before and Catherine's response to it is that there's an intense uh, uh, anxiety about the technology. Incredible, because everything becomes big brother. Mm -hmm. When I think about what's the difference between that kind of a system and a learning management system for a university or for a school that has your name, your address, your parents' work, you know, every class you've taken, every, you know, and we say, oh, this is great because this is centralized information and it makes us effective. It, it allows us to understand uh, who's in our system, who isn't in our system, who's matriculating, et cetera. So, I know that there's a lot of anxiety, and I don't think that that's something we should disregard, but how are we gonna move forward and try to make sure that we don't have, you know, all of these ballots that are coming, you know, from the 1980s, you know, people who've been dead since the 80s, uh, you know, how, how are we going to do that unless we get with the technology? But it is a hard sell. Well, it it, well be. what happened with Russia? I mean, transparency yeah. is yeah, the, but, Well, the it is a tough issue. And also, there's something to think about if we're going to do a centralized system, what if the government began to know who voted for who? But we need to move on to the next segment QWERTY quips. Here are three QWERTY quips for today. So I'm gonna start with this one retweeted by Steven Crowder, Tom Jordan's actual tweet. Louder with Crowder holds Michigan rally to pressure Governor Whitmer to release nursing home data. He claims 34% death rate grossly underestimated only based on 10% of long-term facilities. This is obviously a major problem because at the behest of our governor, she is permitting them to put COVID patients in nursing homes with the most vulnerable population of all who's more susceptible to die from COVID. And there are lots of senior citizens dying. I know someone personally whose mother died in that capacity. Actually, I know a couple of people who have relatives die in that capacity. And I, under, I don't understand why there's more pressure on her. And I feel like our local news isn't doing much about dealing with that because 
why isn't there more public scrutiny? Why isn't there more public pressure? Well, why, what do you guys think? And why are the legislators not talking about the fact that they subpoenaed that very information from her back in April and they never got a response as far as I know? So um, this is something that's been a huge problem that, uh, but also you said that she was allowing those patients to go in. Her executive orders are basically mandating that those patients go in those places where we have the most immunocompromised um, people involved in our whole state, the people we should be protecting from COVID-19, the people that should be in theory quarantining, we're bringing the disease right to them. And then too, and you know, we... on, a, on a kind of on a moral level too, her kind of zeal towards these unnecessary lockdowns become ridiculous because you claim you're doing it to save lives when you're directly doing something that's killing people. So then it's like you're contradicting yourself. So now we feel, I know you're not being honest, lady. <laughs> what, one of the problems with those numbers is they may vastly underestimate the true number. As I understand how they collected them, uh, so one third of the deaths are presumed to have occurred in the nursing homes, but they literally mean in the nursing home. So if they came into a room and they found a patient dead, that counted as in the nursing home. But if they were sick and transported to the hospital, as I understand how they collected these numbers, mm -hmm. they were considered a hospital death. So in fact, our numbers could be vastly higher than one third um, were, were uh, died in nursing homes. And why that's so relevant is, is this, when we look at the final numbers, when eventually those come out, this may show that COVID is truly a disease of the disabled elderly and that many of these steps we've taken that are impinging on the freedoms of, of younger, healthier people are totally unwarranted and we should be focusing our resources and our attention on those who are most vulnerable. Yeah, and also a point I had, even the way that the death, deaths are recorded, because from what yeah. I understand, there are people who are considered counted in the COVID death number when they didn't actually die from COVID, they yeah. died with COVID. And no, I don't know not if even anyone, that. I, I don't know if anyone's ever read a death certificate. I'm sure you have, yeah. but they specifically list your diseases, but what specifically killed you. And so for those numbers, they're really faulty to be used to justify these lockdowns. It's just really egregious. Yeah, actually, part, part of those numbers may have been inflated. People worry that they were uh, illicitly inflated to try to push a political narrative, but part of it could have been totally um, totally innocent, but nonetheless inflated because how a billing and coding was done originally when COVID came about, they said, listen, we will pay you and be sure you are paid as a doctor, as a hospital, if you are taking care of a COVID patient. So normally collection rates on those things are maybe around 60%. So there, there's an inclination by just human nature mm -hmm. to say, well, geez, this person had a cough, it's possibly had COVID. I'll put that down there. Now I have 100% certainty I'm gonna get paid for this death. So it may have been many individuals acting on their own self-interest that artificially inflated those numbers, not necessarily some vast conspiracy. You know, there is a vast conspiracy. In fact, our National Center for Health Statistics, which is part of the CDC, specifically put out in uh, March and in April that medical professionals were not allowed to code anything. In fact, if there was somebody who died with presumed COVID-19, they had not done the testing, um, they were not allowed to claim that's a 7.2 ICD code. Uh, they were required to put a 7.1 ICD code, which says, which is reserved uh, worldwide for those that are laboratory confirmed. In fact, they said that if you go ahead and you put a 7.2 or non-confirmed case just suspected, like you had a cough or any of the common symptoms that also are shared with the flu, that they would go and change those numbers and they would make it, in fact, look like it's a laboratory confirmed case. In fact, the director of the National Center on Health Statistics went and said that uh, we need to make sure that we are reporting COVID-19 as a cause of death more often than not. So there definitely is a conspiracy here and it starts right there uh, with the CDC. Who oversees that? Well, the CDC is part of our um, executive branch at this point, but I would argue that the conspiracy theory started before the CDC. The National Institute of Health website shows that uh, they had paid for the creation of the coronavirus out of the Wuhan lab in order to create a vaccine for it. With so Dr. Why, why, are we, why are we spending money creating problems so that we can create solutions to? That's like government, we, that's, government should not be involved in creating problems so that we can create a solution. That is a waste of taxpayer money. And, and to build on, on your point too, it's not only corrupting the death certificates, but it's also corrupting the schools. So if there's a presumed case, it doesn't even have to be confirmed, you can literally shut down classrooms based on someone who has a cough. And we're getting into a season with cold and flu season mm -hmm. where you will not have a single school in the entire United States where there is not some kid 
who has a fever, who has a cough at any given time, mm -hmm. and, and without confirm, confirmation, confirmatory testing, do we shut down schools? We well, will that, never have a school open again. It's not even shutting case. down the schools. They're what some of the school districts, especially over here on the east side of Michigan, are doing, are requiring that students are then quarantined at home yeah. for at least 14 days. And if they are not, they are going to utilize the public health code to go and get a court order from a judge mandating that the entire family be quarantined. And that will be done by court order. So we are literally imprisoning people in their homes because of a presumption that somebody might have COVID-19 because they had a cough or a fever or any number of symptoms that actually overlap. The, correct me if I'm wrong, the top six symptoms of COVID-19 are actually the exact same top six symptoms of the flu. Right. Yeah, they're very non-specific, right? And just like in China, now mm -hmm. China did the same thing as you're just alluding to our own government could do to us. The difference is there were dramatic videos of chi the Chinese government literally welding people into apartments. We're doing it without the welding. And, and that's dangerous too when you think about the way our government is going to grow. There's a, that's the liberty issue right there because we can use fear to justify the growth of government. Just for example, like in Connecticut, their governor, um, at the height of the COVID issue, it was a baby who died. I guess they were dropped by their nanny, and he said it was a COVID death. When in reality, the child died because they were dropped. So there's there's a lot going on. Well, what do you think? In terms of the inflated numbers, inflated numbers are the whole issue. Well, of I'm, you know, I think I represent a large swath of the population that is just horrified with the idea of sending people who are uh, positive into environments with the most vulnerable, and I don't know where is the accountability in terms of saying here's the logic behind it or we had no other options but i mean i don't understand where if i can where actually, that where that came from like where because i would like to think that the people who are in office who are serving who are there working are trying to do their best mm -hmm. and this seems like you know throwing gasoline and and a, and a match mm -hmm and saying, well, you know, it's a big bonfire now. If I can I jump in the, uh, that uh, as a physician, I think I understand originally why they had that intent. Back in, in late February and March, we had no idea how bad this was gonna be and the initial projections, the modeling, which has been not wrong, almost egregiously wrong to the point we should never trust some of these people ever again. They were off, some of the models were off 50 to 100 factor. Um, uh, for what actually occurred, but they thought the hospitals were going to be overwhelmed, so they were scrambling trying to look at new places to stow people, and they looked at the nursing homes as a potential uh, case, and they tried to physically separate. They said, okay, the regular long-term patients over here, the, the, the new COVID patients here, we're going to separate them totally. We're going to even have different staff taking care of them, no shared services, but somehow, and this shows our ignorance as to what's really going on, somehow that virus, despite uh, 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 draconian efforts, got over to the healthy people and killed many people. I actually, I'm not a fan of, of the fact that they were put in nursing homes, but I do understand the rationale on which they based it. What I don't understand is the dogged determination to continue that failed and dangerous policy for many months after it was clearly faulty. You know, and I know this is anecdotal, but the person I'm referring to, they had a COVID patient in their room. So there's no oh. accountability on the behalf of the nursing homes to make sure that the COVID patients will be in a separate wing. So do we want to move on to the next yeah. court equip? Well, I mean, this is right in step with what we've been talking about already. This is from uh, Conrad Rolson from Individual Allies of North America, which is uh, a, a Facebook page that calls together many sort of liberal voices. So he says, with over 205,000 COVID-19 related deaths and their fearless leader, Trump is infected with COVID-19, Trump's followers demonstrate an incredible amount of ignorance and stupidity. So um, kind of being of the, of the opinion that didn't we see this coming, um, the arrogance with which he was denying mask wearing and uh, holding rallies and insisting on uh, that model of didn't our Democratic well, governor do that as well though and she wasn't she linking arm in arm with all kinds of people right in downtown Detroit um, and that was okay wearing masks was she um, no I'm pretty sure um, a lot of the photos show that she in fact was not wearing masks at those times she was one a couple of problems with the whole thing number one Let's talk about how a lot of the officials said that at church you can't sing, but yet the governor was at this rally shouting. 
So I, mean, I don't know, do you have to put a, a melody to it for it to be permissible? <laughs> then she was linking arms and arms with people marching. Then we had the riots, and you even had people on CNN saying, oh, there's no evidence that the riots and the marches are spreading COVID. So let me guess, COVID-19 has the ont ontological abilities to differentiate between a Republican and a Democratic or a liberal conservative event and say, oh, we're not gonna, it's not gonna spread at a liberal event or a liberal function, but at a conservative so function. So rioting is spread. okay that this, just, the COVID just, does not spread there. It's well. like you're being Gaslight. It's like, okay, if the disease spread in large groups, regardless of why the people are gathered, it's going to spread. And so I think a lot of the hypocrisy that people have seen have made us feel like, okay, this is just, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Like, yes, COVID is real. We know people are dying, but how much restriction should be put on us? I mean, alcohol is dangerous. There's lots of things that are dangerous. Driving in a car. Yeah. Do we well, in, in a free that? society, you're free to make bad decisions. So, Christina, you're talking, I think you're making a, an interesting point that we ought to pay a little heed to, right? So, depending on, on which rally, you know, it's, it's either spreading or it's not spreading, right? right? This is clearly an issue of transparency. It's an issue of trust. Uh, and, and it's an issue of whether or not Individual liberty, is it not? I, I mean, you can't. Yes, absolutely, it's individual. You, yeah, the, the whole concept of shutting down the individual economy liberty is, is blatantly peacefully. unconstitutional. The, the, it's a violation of our First Amendment right to assembly. You can't yeah. do that. I think yeah. one of the arguments to the counter, even though I'm more along the lines of your narrative, is that if your decision harms other people, then it should be the purview of some broader. I, 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 I would, I would say one of the big things that's been lost in this is what's considered settled science. The mask issue, despite all the consternation to the, to the contrary, is not settled science. Science, in fact, is never settled. So then why um, is, well, okay, science is not never settled. But we settled, need to live and, and work the, in a world, idea, I mean, we can't. The yeah, idea is of it a not wearing a mask, right, right. Need to be able to have clearly science. a mask is going to prevent me from spinning on you, right? So that's scientific proof right, right there that of if, if it, of, well, if of coronavirus is spread through saliva and particles in the air, if, if that's the case, but we don't know that that's Actually, really we do know. In fact, the particles of COVID-19 are so <clears> small <throat> that if you wear an N65 mask and you actually wear that, say, as a, as a tested positive patient for, say, four to six hours, by the end of that period of time, you swab the outside, you swab the inside afterwards. Swabbing the outside actually reveals that more of the spores have now been on the outside of the mask than are on the inside because the spores are so tiny, they go through there. That's why all the masks Say. And this Only is, in America can you believe that two plus two is five and white is dark and <laughs> no, dark is no, white. No, no, well, but this, it, it, this is, as a doctor, what do you say to that? Well, and the, the, what you guys are referencing are kinetic studies, how things move. There is a difference between studying how things move and the actual transmission rate. There actually have not been many studies actually saying if you do this, you actually prevent with testing and real world studies proving. That doesn't mean it won't, right? It means those studies have either not yet been done or as, as was found in, in May from the CDC, the studies looking now, they were using analogous viruses, things like flus, but the studies to date looking at influenzas, there wasn't a lack of data, there was negative data. They showed that influenza was not impacted by mask wearing. Now in July, the CDC came back out and said, no, no, the studies are clearly support their use. But if you look at their statement and you look at the references at the bottom and you click on them and you open them up, they are referencing kinetic studies, not transmission studies. That doesn't mean it couldn't be true, but there's a difference between this is a settled science but, so and the, the one other thing is one of the studies they referenced was a hospital in Boston and they said, well, we didn't have masks and the infections went up. We did use masks and they went down. The problem, if you look at the transmission curve in that community at the time, they were, they were not wearing masks and it was going up in the general community and they started wearing and was coming down. It may have been totally ironic timing that could have influenced that study. And Judy, what, would you have uh, anything? That, well, any I, I think that it, things are um, just coincidence sometimes. Yeah, yeah. When you're talking about one, that's not statistically significant at all. To say in one hospital we saw with mask wearing yeah. it went up and mask wearing it didn't, you know, uh, those kinds of things have absolutely zero bearing on any kind of uh, statistical significance at all to have one. And let's not forget that the position was changed. The first we were told masks didn't matter, then we were told masks didn't matter, did matter. Then we see photos of Dr. Fauci with his mask down, not social distancing. So we're hearing so many conflicting messages and that causes distrust in the public. And I feel this also goes back to a liberty oh. issue because if a person feels that a mask is safer, let them wear one. Exactly, let if them wear one. If a person doesn't want to wear one, then let them not wear one. We all take reasonable risks when we leave our house. Yes. But to say that other people should be forced to wear something that inhibits on their breathing to make me more comfortable is ridiculous because why don't we just extend this like to, to flu season? You, you can't, can't mandate how, how, how wearing one. Why you don't we just wear one it. forever? I mean, there's, 
I mean, I don't mean because to sound this is like not, a cold it's, it's, person. I don't right. mean to sound cold, but death is a part of human reality. It is. I mean, we, we, we can't stave off death forever. So I'm not going to be miserable in the and process. And this is not going away. It, and it's, it's not. So, I mean, how long are we going to do this? There's no end date in sight. Yeah. And so I think there's, with conflicting messages, with the, the motives and the protests, not spreading it, but Trump's rallies, is spreading it. I mean, all of that mixed in together for your average American, it just seems have, like crap. And you have Joe's point, um, and he talked about different things, but even ending on the like kind of liberty issues, and he mentioned First Amendment, um, I don't know about you, but my religious beliefs definitely say we are not supposed to be masking ourselves. We're supposed to be having true open fellowship with each other. Mm -hmm. So you'd have the religious aspects, but what about all the people that have, I also have a medical exemption. I literally have a direct primary care physician uh, who was able to write me a, um, a note that explained that I have a medical reason for not wearing it. But guess what? The governor also has in her executive orders, which have now been declared unconstitutional, of course, by our state Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, but those, um, you know, she recognized that people who have, say, a hearing disability or other need to be able to read lips, such as myself, my whole family or anybody who's with me at that time, or if I go to a store or if I need to engage in services, I'm constantly having to say to them that I need them to pull down their mask because I read lips. And guess what? I am not a tiny fraction of the population. There are many people out there um, who don't even realize how much they rely on lip reading uh, to be able to communicate with people. Which is so, unintended consequences, right? And, and that's exactly. some of the issues with the studies on the, of the masks. One of the unintended consequences of mask wearing is you massively increase touching your face. Exactly. And we know that's one way of potential uh, Spreading transmission. The exactly. and you think, well, I didn't touch my face, I touched the outside of the mask, but they're finding that actually the COVID can, it can uh, coat um, the outside of the mask. Now you touch your face, you don't think about it later. In fact, they think that this is perhaps one of the ways the president may have uh, contracted it, is, is you touch the outside of the mask, then later on you're touching other areas of your face that are exactly. unprotected, it can get in through your eyes. Is that all masks? Uh, well, they just looked at mask wearing. That in general, when you wear a mask, you tend to fidget with your face quite right, a bit. Right. And that was a real concern with children. Well, and if you remember, you're getting to the point, I think, Judy, of, of maybe like the cloth mask yes. versus the N65 yeah. or any yeah, of those right. things. Yes. Um, but keep in mind that the N65, all those other kind of surgical 95, masks, yeah. and, uh, sorry, 95, yep. uh, and all those other masks, there's a five in there somewhere, um, <laughs> they have. Um, you know, they, they say right on there that you're only supposed to wear them for limited use. You're not oh. supposed to have the same mask wear all day long. Yep. Or in fact, like a lot of people do, you know, I, I'm very cheap, for example. So yeah. if I were a mask wearer, I wouldn't want to have to buy, you know, multiple masks for that day. Yeah. So you have a mask. In fact, our governor said uh, when she said we were finally allowed to get off a of house arrest enough to go to walk in a park, she encouraged us to keep a mask in our pocket, in our back pocket and take it out. So when you inc so encounter somebody within six feet of you, then you then put it on your face. I mean, there is no way that that's going to help and stop the transmission. And as a physician to build on what you're saying, I've had patients who come in and because they're obligated to wear a mask, they pull the mask off and I see multiple shades of lipstick on the inside. Yeah. These are putrescent masks <laughs> putrescent. that are, that, that are, that I actually ding, I mean ding, to think ding. about it. They're, yeah, they're wearing, a, they're, they're wearing a spittle covered rag on their oh, face yeah, and that's, that's not necessarily okay. sanitary in itself. If you were going to do it right, you'd have to wear it appropriate yeah. options and frequently accept it. What about the gloves issue? I remember once I was um, poll watching during the primaries and I saw a woman with gloves on and she, her gloves were like ripped at the fingertips. Well, or you see people touching multiple surfaces with gloves. Like, and they'll be, a, you'll be at a grocery store and they have multiple customers come right. through and they have gloves on. It's like you're spreading it, disease it, yeah, and all kinds of germs even worse. It's all conceptual. That's all conceptual. Our skin is our best barrier to infection. As long as you have intact skin, mm. At least, the, the, mm -hmm. we do not believe that it's penetrating through the skin. It gets through mucous membranes and mm -hmm. such that it, it could be entering. There's, in fact, probably no reason for a glove. And the belief is that gloves give people false confidence. Yes. So now they're grabbing right. everything in the store That's and then again touching their face with their glove. Yeah. I've seen practices. people with their gloves touch their cell phone. I'm like, whoa, yeah. super yeah. spreader. And I also yeah. have a question. I heard that in the palm of your fingers that there's some kind of antibacterial property in your fingers. Yeah, very, very good, See? yes. Actually, so our skin kills bacteria. Um, they did studies on gloves where they would swab them and they found like that uh, bacteria like E. coli will persist on a glove where it would die on your skin. Mm -hmm. So your, your skin is, is not only a barrier, it actually has combative aspects mm -hmm. that help prevent you from getting infected. So let me, let me ask you something that I think a lot of people um, who are the laity uh, would, would want to yeah. know. If masks really aren't very good at preventing the, sp the spread of disease, then why are physicians who are, let's say, conducting surgeries yeah. always masked? Yeah, it's mean, like, an why? excellent question. And understand, as I say all of this, my argument is not that they absolutely never could work, it's that the science is not settled. 
That's actually more my argument, because the argument is the science is settled and anybody who says you're, you don't believe that masks are helpful is anti-science, which is preposterous. So th the reason surgeons wear masks is not pr pr protecting the surgeons to protect the patient because of the argument of spitting. You know, so essentially you're talking, you, the, you ask for a scalpel, ask from the nurse, you, you know, you, some spittle shoots out, ends up in the wound, now you have mm -hmm. a terrible wound infection. They found that, that wound infections decreased when surgeons wear masks, not that surgeons got sick less. Okay. Okay. So, so let me ask you a question, because from my perspective, it seems like the, the idea of wearing masks is, is, so, is such a hot topic. It's because there's consideration to actually mandate wearing masks. Now, Catherine, is that not unconstitutional? It's right? entirely unconstitutional, no matter how you slice it. But certainly in, uh, in our Michigan Constitution, I mean, even if you look at Article 1, Section 23, that we have all those unenumerated rights. But again, in the Ninth Amendment of our U.S. Constitution, so any state in the entire United States, uh, we also have the unenumerated rights. So we didn't have to put in there, our founders didn't have to put in there and look into the future and say, well, at some point, we're going to have to be able to say that you have the right to breathe fresh air without putting a mask on your face. Well, we, we, we do. do have the Fourth Amendment right to be secure in our person. In our we property, do. Right? So it, that means... Article 1, Section 17 of our state constitution as well. It's Are you a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> she eats she oh, wow. constitution for breakfast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I have yeah. another, another point that I'm I think delicious. should be considered too is, is people are not looking at all the other consequences. I was talking to someone yesterday and he was saying that his wife has been struggling with like anxiety and depression since the lockdowns. Yeah. You have people who are becoming more, al becoming more addicted to alcohol mm -hmm. and drugs and other vices that are very dangerous. Also as people in education, a lot of students are in very dysfunctional homes and school is their only outlet. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like this false notion that you are only permitted to care about certain things. The only thing I can care about is COVID. Yeah. And if you talk about any other topic, it's like blasphemy. And, Boy, and it's such an it. ignorant perspective. In you fact, just nailed it. I mean, that's, that's when, yeah. when they're, they're, they call it single variant analysis. Mm -hmm. All the epidemiologists, Fauci and such, are focusing purely on COVID with no thought to the consequences broader. That's where Atlas actually does a fairly good job. He's part of the, the, the White House task force. Um, because like you mentioned, suicide, actually Redfield, who's the head of the CDC, came out recently, and he did not say more children are dying from suicide than COVID. He said many more. Many, many more children are dying from suicide, and yet we restrict our children. Exactly. Um, and that's leading to depression and causing an increase. And that's things that are, are measurable. What about all the un immeasurable things like future financial impact? You guys make a difference as educators. Mm -hmm. They've actually shown that if you disrupt education, your lifetime earning potential is decreased. If your lifetime earning potential is decreased, you are more likely to die prematurely. So in an attempt to protect our, our elderly today, which are really the people who are susceptible for COVID, we may cause our children to die prematurely later How when about now? we won't know about. How about prematurely now? Because I'm, mm -hmm. I've been uh, serving as a lawyer guardian ad litem, protecting children and representing children in abuse and neglect cases for many years. Mm -hmm. And I can tell mm -hmm. you that as someone who's done that, I've uh, been a mediator in abuse and neglect cases and special ed mediations, and I've done a lot of divorce work as an attorney. I could tell you that children, like it was kind of referenced, you have, I, I had most recently done restorative justice in a school district that was, um, uh, you know, in a, in a what high- What is restorative justice? Oh, well, uh, that's a whole other show. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. helping, a whole other it, thing. It, it's helping students to work with those that they are harming to create a solution where they have responsibility for fixing the problem and not just getting suspended and then brought back into the school right. environment where the victim has no say and the offender has no uh, responsibility to fix it. So, so true justice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that, and so, that's what any political them, candidate for president should be working on to return to constitutionality in the United States. That's restorative justice. But, but, with, the, but with these concepts in mind of, of the children Children that need, you know, that are possibly in those homes where maybe it's a single, uh, single parent household, and so the parent is out working, and they have nobody to care for that child, and yeah. we, you don't have uh, the way to get all that extra, you know, child care. And quite frankly, if all these kids from these one parent households are all going to have to go to daycare anyway, then how is that any different from having them in a school district? You're and I can tell you that I have, I have a high school senior who I just got the letter yesterday that they were telling parents, you better come up and pick up your child because we're going to go to fully virtual school for the, at least the next two weeks. Why? Because a singular bus driver, a singular bus driver tested positive for COVID-19. Now keep in mind this is less deadly than the flu, but we're going to make sure that all these... Groups? Well, uh, well, for, yeah, well, actually... With the, um, Not elderly. Elderly, it's more. Um, it, it is, slightly it, Under more. age 70, it's actually it's about 15. If you're over age 80, it's 15 times more fatal than flu. But if you're under age 20, it's like 1 The exactly. flu is not even less than that. In fact, if you are over age 80, you are and you contract flu and you're in the, if the, the school age range, 15 to 17, that 80 plus year old is 10 
thousand times more likely to die from COVID than the school age child. Exactly. So those children that are not going to die from COVID-19 are then sent home where they might not have a meal. They might not have um, internet. In fact, the school district that is doing this, I guess I don't want to quite name them just yet. Uh, they um, made Heartland, it very clear. Right? Heartland, right? Yeah. Oh, it's very hard to not say it. Uh, but they made it very clear that they, even though there's a lot of the school district that's in the rural population, rural areas, and they don't have access to internet. In fact, you can't even get like a, a DSL or cable connection at all. Uh, it is up to the parents to go out and try to get that internet connection themselves. So now their child's really not going to be receiving an education. They might be left home alone because the parent has to work. So it most harms the poor. It, it harms right? the poor. It yeah, harms the people. Harms the poor. Even if you have people that are now the school districts that I was doing the restorative justice in, that was in the middle of inner city. Okay. So we didn't have the issues of not being able to have internet as much and things like that. However, you know, if you have a parent who's working two, three jobs and they have multiple kids in different areas, even though the school districts were providing this uh, come pick up a meal option, how many times is the parent going to be able to leave work right. and to be able to bring their children, you know, collect all their children, get in the car or have whatever transportation they might not have uh, to be able to go over to where the, this other school is where they're going to be able to pick up yeah. the food or get other resources, uh, get schooling packets or whatever. And there will be some child who is harmed because they are forced to stay home alone without supervision because the parent is working. There will be some child who lets who microwaves a macaroni and cheese and without the water neglect. and sets a fire. It, yeah, it, and yes, now the parent's then, gonna be in trouble. But then you tie in the abuse factor. So even yeah. the World Health Organization, that's the leading driving force behind all this happening in our United States here, they say that if any one of these factors, anytime you have a significant job loss, anytime you have um, downturn in the economy, anytime that you have um, you know, anything where you're, you're pulled away from any of your uh, social supports, you know, your AA or your domestic violence or anything like that, you have uh, much higher instances of domestic violence mm -hmm as well as child abuse and neglect. And the thing is, when we have children that are returning to the homes and they're not in the buildings, all the mandated reporters, right? You have school bus drivers, your co coaches, your teachers, your principals, your crossing guards, all of them, none of them are able to see the children. This is our educators topic. Do you it, guys have yeah, anything yeah, to I, say? I'd like to say something about the curriculum development. I think um, uh, virtual learning is possible and it, and it could work for a lot of kids. Maybe the type of family where the parents are more involved but there's no curriculum developed for that. So it's just try right. this, try that, right. and, and the kids are not getting educated. I've seen it with yeah, my I've, own I've heard grandkids. teachers too, it's an incredible burden on them because oh. they've had school plans, you know, class sure. plans for years that they've built on, mm -hmm. refined, and now they're being told to reinvent and, the wheel. And then yeah. also one thing we need to consider, special ed kids. Kids with either yeah. cognitive or emotional no, impaired sure. oh, yeah. students, that is going to be an absolute nightmare. And even as a parent, if you are not equipped to educate, teaching your child and parenting them are two different things, but we need to think about our special needs kids. But we need to move on to our third court equip. Joe, go ahead. Thank you for the pass on that, Christina. <laughs> so for those of you watching at home, uh, I am a presidential candidate, an independent candidate. And uh, since we've got a Republican and Democratic tweet, I'm going to represent the majority in the middle. And so I tweeted uh, back in May that the purpose of government is to enable the people to live freely and without fear. And I think that if we take that into consideration, then we may actually, in my personal opinion, I believe that we have uh, many disputed reports, right? I think we can agree on that. That's probably a function of transparent, of lack of transparency, the fact that so much of our government hides behind classification. And, um, you know, we're, I think we're over relying on science here instead of on logic. And really, the question I'd like to ask is, are we, is it, is it possible that, that this entire conversation is, is somewhat irrelevant when we have a nation of personal responsibility, it's built on strong families, and it's about enabling the individual and the families to care for themselves. And in the context of the tweet, it's about helping the government, the government's there to serve the people, right? And so in the context of the NIH creating the virus so that they can create a solution to it, is it possible that this whole thing is a distraction or maybe done on purpose? And if so, why? Well, I'll tell you, if our president <clears throat> succumbs to this and it was created in a Chinese lab, yeah. Funded, by American, funded by American dollars. Yeah. 
Well, okay, well, American dollars. I mean, I don't want to get up too off topic, but was it private organizations? I mean, no, it was like, government money. It was government money. money. And that's uh, when uh, Dr. Fauci was involved with the initial um, uh, investigating on that. But you brought up a good point, though, in the purpose of government. And it says right in our Constitution that the purpose of government is to cure the blessings of liberty, right? It also says that, though, in our very state constitution, the Michigan Constitution, that we, the people, the state of Michigan, grateful to Almighty God for the blessings of freedom and earnestly desiring to secure these blessings, undiminished to ourselves and our posterity do ordain and establish this constitution. So then you kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, this is a distraction, this is, you know, about personal responsibility and things like that. Um, I wanted to kind of bring up a topic, though, especially with two educators here on our panel, that um, although our United States Constitution doesn't talk about education, our state constitution, Article 8, is the whole, uh, the whole thing's about education. And we see that religion, morality, and knowledge are necessary to good government, so, uh, so schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. But also that we see in um, Article 8, Section 2, the legislature shall maintain and support a system of free public education um, as defined by law. And so uh, Judy's point about the education and that it works for some people to do this virtual stuff and others it does not, and all these other points that are being raised today, we need, you know, I'm going to always advocate, we need to bring it back to the Constitution. And at least here in the state of Michigan, our Constitution does not allow for things like this to happen because we have we owe it to our children to be able to have that education Wasn't piece. there a court case uh, like two years ago about some kids sue about education being a civil right and I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming they the city of gleaned, Detroit. A, gleaned upon that point there but I think also when we talk about um, how the struggles people are having I think it kind of reflects the breakdown of the social fabric of America. So I just want to take a moment to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Chad Savage for joining us today and being a part of the court Quips. Uh, it's been a lively discussion we have enjoyed having him especially with the area of expertise and because I didn't give you that moment could you take a moment and just explain uh, with a frame of reference that you brought us today. Sure. So first of all, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be the uh, the first fifth seat, right? I've always been used to being a third wheel, so I've never been a fifth seat before. So I'm I'm thrilled for that. Terrible humor. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, my job is as a uh, as an unemployed uh, comedian. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm a physician, obviously. I uh, actually was one of the first people in the state of Michigan to open what's called a direct primary care clinic, which means I used to be an insurance-based doc, worked through a hospital system. Uh, realized that how we pay for medical care was corrupting not only the practice but driving up the costs. So I did something crazy in the middle of my life with a mortgage and kids and I decided to, to leave that, take a crazy chance on something brand new where I worked instead for my patients in a membership model of medical care. We, we get paid $49 to $79 a month from our members. They never pay for visits where there's no co-pays. They access us through telemedicine and everything else. And uh, we get them discounted meds, labs, imaging, and they can combine it with things like health sharing, short-term limited duration policies, indemnity policies to save so much on health care that I actually had an op-ed recently in town hall that it, where I did the calculations for my own family in the last five years, if you extrapolate it to 10 years, the savings I've had with my coverage and medical care, I'm not depriving myself of medical care, I saved enough to buy a house if you extrapolate the 10 years. $88,000 in savings on my medical care while accessing care, not depriving medical care. Uh, and it just shows you get how- better access, I would argue, because yeah. I'm, I have, well, I'm a care. patient yeah, of a direct primary care facility. So um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if you took that kind of savings extrapolated across the society, people would have enough money to afford their medical care. And by doing that, having the patient back uh, uh, you know, as the director of medical care, um, you would realign all the interests of the healthcare system. The, the healthcare system focuses on the payer. So if it's the government paying, if it's the insurance companies paying, they focus to get that payment. But when the patient is the one who controls those resources, the entire interest of the healthcare system revolves around that patient. You will improve care, improve quality, and you don't need a government intervention to do that. You need to empower the patient. Can I, I'd like to ask Chad a question. Just one qu before, sure. I, yeah, I just have a question of clarification that I think I understand, but I want to mm -hmm. make sure the viewers understand. And so for your perspective is actually coming in as a primary care physician. So That's you right. were the main family doctor for a lot of people. Yep, internal med, but yeah. Right. So, well, let's speak our language, not yours. Um, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but, and I think Joe has uh, alluded to some things um, that as fighting on, uh, from his terminology for the people in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, that he has a perspective on this. Is that what you're kind of getting at, Joe? Well, actually, what I wanted to ask Chad was, because you're talking a little bit about finance, you're talking about healthcare, mm -hmm. and, and I think you mentioned off camera something about uh, direct consumer ability to access the doctor, right? Yes. Can you just tell us a little bit about 
how direct access to the doctor could potentially drive down costs and increase accessibility for everyone in America? Yeah. Well, it works in every other aspect of our economy, right? You don't have to have the government controlling the prices at Kroger because you know, Meyer has a, has, a, has a grocery store too and people price shop. So they, they control each other's costs through competition. We need that in healthcare. Right now there's a single set payment, and whether anybody knows it or not, I wrote up ads on this too, where the, the prices in American healthcare are set by the relative value committee at the AMA, the government rubber stamps them, they become the Medicare rate and every private payer bases their payment on the Medicare rate. So there are 31 people at the AMA who largely set prices for the United States with various modifiers which is essentially very similar to a Politburo, and we all know how well that went. So the government effectively is setting prices and insurance companies are going along with it? And oh, the yeah, government absolutely. rubber stamps so, so it. So with the yeah. AMA, how do those 31 people get to that position to make those decisions? Oh, that's an excellent point. It's very special <laughs> interest laden, right? Most of them are proceduralists, so surgeons and things of this sort. Mm -hmm. That's why primary care and, and uh, intellectual uh, specialty fields within medicine are, are poorly reimbursed. That, that panel is dominated by proceduralists like surgeons. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have me back, I'd be happy to talk you off. Self interest. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. How many people, how many doctors are in this well, club? Uh, there's over a thousand practices now in the United States. We are growing at a rate faster than Starbucks. All right. That's well, we, fantastic. we definitely look forward to hearing more about this on right. later Absolutely. episodes. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in today for our episode of The Fifth Seat, where we had our very special guest here sitting in the sixth seat, and we look forward to having you back for our next episode.